a story down there about these people that went looking for giant trees. And they, they, they ran into what they thought was a cliff. It was a tree so big that the circumference of it was 33 metres round. That's huge, like if you measure 33 metres around and you picture how wide that is, you can just imagine how much of the tree standing above it. Some people think it's a legend, I don't. I think it's really there. Now if I could find something like that and see something like that, that's a phenomenon of nature that just is a freak, you know? It's one of those big things that just is unbelievable. He was the Director General of Forestry for the whole of Australia. He said that the trees in Australia were so big that he thought the biggest trees in the world existed here. Now I can imagine how beautiful and pristine it would be to walk through the forest when he was a boy. Now when I go walking, I hear bulldozers. You've got the largest living thing in the world and you have a, an environment that is being torn apart. Yeah, we only missed this thing by about a week standing. Almost 13, probably about 12.7 metres. Wow. If I come across a 33 metre stump, then that's going to be devastating. But this isn't just about giant trees. I found an entire ecosystem under threat. Now these ancient forests can look more like a war zone. Tasmania has some of the most unusual wildlife I have ever seen. Some of these creatures are found nowhere else in the world. We can show people that this environment needs to be protected. And we've been searching for some giant trees through Tasmania for a few years now and we've found big ones, the biggest of their species. And we have some tip-offs. We still have trees in Tasmania that could be the biggest trees in the world. People won't realise what we have here they won't realise that these giant trees exist. Tasmania is one of the few places left in the world where ancient forests have survived intact since the time of the dinosaurs. These rainforests have hardly changed in 65 million years. A living remnant of when this land was only part of a supercontinent called Gondwana. It was a time when rainforests covered most of Australia. Standing high above the rainforest understory are the tallest flowering plants in the world, the eucalyptus regnans, kings of the forest. These giant eucalypts are found only in Australia's southern forests and Tasmania is home to some of the biggest. Forests are more than just big trees. They support an entire ecosystem, especially these mature trees with holes and hollow trunks, which are home to countless creatures from billions of tiny insects and many of our unique birds and marsupials. It was these forests that inspired my grandfather's story of the giant trees. I'm back in Tasmania, my childhood home, to follow in my grandfather's footsteps, to see for myself what's happening to these amazing forests. In my 
my search for giant trees, I team up with Ronnie and Andrew. Ronnie is a Texan big tree hunter. He knows that the biggest things in the world are not all in his home state of Texas. You'll be happy when you see it because it's really big. Really big? Really big. Ronnie has made many trips to Tasmania, convinced that this is where he has the best chance to find the world's tallest trees. We've been told there's a whopper out here. We found the monster tree that Andrew and Ronnie were looking for, but it's been a couple of years since they were told about it and it seems to have fallen over. How big was this one, Ronnie? Well, just from looking at it and trying to take the best measures we, measurements we could, we figure it's probably about 17 metres in girth. 17 metre girth and more than 70 metres high. It's been standing in the forest for over 400 years and fell over just before we got here. Some people think a fallen tree like this one is just a waste of wood. But even in depth, a tree goes on giving life. Moulds, fungus, lichens, insects, and billions of microscopic creatures all help break down the fallen tree and nourish the soil. Well, it's not often you get to sit at the top of one of the tallest trees, is it? Even though it has fallen down. <laughs> and we didn't make it fall down. No, 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 it was here. We found it like this. I shouldn't have climbed out under that branch. <laughs> So, Ronnie, how come you're in Australia? Well, I'm in Australia because um, there's a lot of opportunity to find big trees, and, uh, and where I'm from, most of the big trees have been measured, and, you know, it, all the work's pretty much done now. They're just kind of wrapping it up, so there's a lot of opportunity, you know, in uh, Australia to really go out and find a really big tree, and that's why I'm here. I love it. We've been told about another huge tree not far from here. And there she is, a mighty eucalyptus obliqua. Wow, that's a beauty. These giant eucalyptus obliquas are cousins of the regnans and almost as big. Just on 17 metres, then. Eh? 17 metres? 17 metres around, very little buster thing, which is significant, which makes it a huge volume tree. Easily one of the best and biggest eucalyptus obliquus in Australia. No doubt about it. Adam getting out in the forest and looking for it. But I mean, that's the whole excitement. I mean, when you find something like this, your heart just starts racing. <laughs> you just see this massive column, column coming out of the forest, and you're like, man, I got to get there. You're just like plowing through the forest, tripping. And you get there, you're just like, wow, you're just awestruck by this. I mean, it just blows you away. I mean, you realize when you see this tree, this tree is easily over 400 years Oh, I mean, this tree was here before the first European set foot on Tasmania's soil. Deep in Tasmania's ancient rainforest are some of the oldest trees in the world. Hue and pine trees are only found in Tasmania, and this one is over 3,000 years old. They can live up to 10,000 years. That's way back to the Ice Age. These temperate rainforests are so rare, they are only found in a few places on Earth. Long before eucalypts even evolved, myrtle forests like this covered much of Australia. On our search for giant trees, we came across this magnificent spreading myrtle. Wow. A direct link back to those ancient rainforests of Gondwana. Nice one. Nice find, Leslie. This is a fantastic magic. Beautiful. This one's a spreading myrtle? Yeah. Now, why would you call it spreading myrtle? <laughs> <laughs> this is most unusual for a myrtle tree. I like the ferns that they yeah. but it like supports the whole ecosystem, yeah. And just Most myrtle trees grow straight up, but this spectacular tree has its own personality. It looks like an enormous octopus.
we've seen some really big trees on our trip around Tasmania. But have you ever seen a tree as pretty as this one? How come this island, the smallest state in Australia, has the biggest trees, ancient forests, and such unique wildlife? It's because it's been isolated for over 10,000 years from the Australian mainland. Cut off by rising seas since the end of the last ice age. Tasmania is the last stronghold for Australia's temperate rainforests. Few places on Earth have maintained the stable weather conditions that have allowed this ancient environment to survive. This makes a great home. These old trees provide a habitat for many animals. In fact, Tasmania's forests are home to some of the strangest creatures you could possibly imagine. like these giant freshwater crayfish, up to a metre long and six kilograms in weight. With bone-crushing claws, they're the largest of their kind in the world. These massive crayfish became endangered because for many years they were a dinner time favourite. They're now protected but are still vulnerable to destruction of their habitat. Baby crayfish are a popular food for elusive platypus, who also share these streams. These shy creatures are so strange. They've got a duck's bill and webbed feet. They're covered with fur, armed with poisonous spurs, lay eggs and even give milk to their young. They are one of only two egg-laying mammals on Earth. The other one is this spiky little guy, the echidna. High above the forest, magnificent birds of prey keep a watchful eye. The Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagle is bigger than his mainland cousin, with a wingspan over two and a half metres. But even such powerful hunters can't survive habitat destruction. Less than a hundred breeding pairs now remain in the wild. One of the favourite foods of Tasmania's carnivores are small marsupials like paddy melons. Their survival is vital to the entire food chain. As the forest darkens, the night shift takes over and nocturnal scavengers look for their evening meal. The Tasmanian devil is a marsupial with powerful jaws that crunch through bones. With a ravenous appetite and terrible table manners, these devils will devour the entire carcass.
tiger cat, another nighttime hunter, joins in the action. Tiger cats are no match for the devils, and this one will have to eat leftovers tonight. Tiger cats are quite capable of bringing down a wallaby three times their size. In the last few years, a mysterious facial tumour disease has developed, devastating the devil population and threatening to wipe them out. It seems many Tasmanian species are on the endangered list. Let's hope they don't go the way of the Tasmanian tiger. My initial adventure to find giant trees was branching into another quest. What's happening to Tasmania's unique wildlife? We need to take a trip back in time to see how forestry practices were in my granddad's day and to see how recent changes might be impacting on the environment. There it is. Ronnie and Andrew found an old steam winch and the old iron boiler that powered the winch, used to pull out trees from the forest. So this goes back before the First World War. <laughs> yes, yeah, from its birthplace in England somewhere, bit by bit, come over on a ship. Pumped out here, here, probably an old dray. You know, what they would do is in the old days, just kind of like they do now, they would put a, a spur road in or a little track in there, right in the middle of the best stand, right in the middle of it, and then they just put all the logs on this little um, tram thing and they'd haul it out by oxen or, you know, that's usually the main thing, they'd haul an oxen and bring it out along this little track and bring it to the mills. Yeah. I would like to see them, like, working without roads and trying to get through all these heavy forests, because in those days they would have just been thick. You can imagine back then, you know, for them to mention a big tree, it would have had to been a really big tree because there were so many. I mean, you know, I remember, I think it was a book that I read somewhere, the average was something close to 15 foot throughs. Have you heard of any legends of, like, really big trees? Yeah, there was one, the airplane tree. Yeah. And the tree was uh, at the headwaters of uh, St. Patrick's River in a place called Targa. And the tree was so big, they cut it down, they couldn't, you know, take off uh, single pieces of log or whatever the sections were the cut off. They had to actually split it down the middle, cut it and break it up in, in pieces and take it because it was just too big. There was this tree this guy named uh, William Ferguson found in 1872. The tree was actually a downer. It was laying across uh, this gully and he taped it off at 132 meters to the broken tip. And he figured that if the broken tip would have been on there, it probably would have been closer to 150 meters is what you're saying. And uh, yeah, and there was other trees reported over 100 meters. My grandpa's got some awesome photos because he was chief of forestry for Australia. Mm -hmm. Oh, and was he? he? Yeah, he's oh, got God, amazing I'm... photographs of the God. really early logging, probably back about 67 years ago. We stumbled across an enormous old loading ramp made from logs. Back then, Timber was mainly used for building. The highest value trees were targeted. Selective logging allowed most of the forest to remain intact. And wildlife was pretty much left unaffected. But today, selective logging has been replaced by clear felling. Logging technology is far more efficient and destructive and is employing fewer people. And the way timber is being used has changed dramatically. Today, Tasmania's forests are mainly used to supply low value wood chips for the paper industry. These valuable timbers are being chopped up into little bits for pulp. 
Yeah, we only missed this thing by about a week standing. It would have been a week earlier when we got to see it. Since the prime. introduction of clear felling in Tasmania, thousands of giant trees have met a similar fate. It's in feet, so actually that's going to be 12, almost 13, probably about 12.7 metres. Wow. Anything that remains is then firebombed. Even El Grande, the biggest tree in Australia, was killed by firebombing. Can you imagine how many tourists would have paid to see Australia's biggest tree? And now look at it. It's worth nothing. Grandad used to take all of us to see trees like this when I was just a little girl. Wasted offcuts and debris from the clear felling ends up in streams. And so does millions of tonnes of eroded topsoil, filling waterways with sediment. But it doesn't end there. The next step is 1080 poison. Using carrots laced with this deadly poison as bait, hundreds of thousands of our native marsupials are being killed to stop them browsing on the new tree plantations. Tasmania is the only state in Australia that poisons its native animals. By using 1080 poison, the whole food chain may be affected. Could this be why the Tasmanian devils at the top of the food chain are suffering so badly with this mysterious face cancer. The native forest is often replaced with monoculture, barren plantations, with row after row of the same species of fast-growing pine trees or eucalypts. The thing I really notice about walking through these plantations is the distinct lack of life. There's no habitat in here to support the biodiversity that you would normally find in our native forests. With plantations, giant trees that take hundreds of years to grow will never come back. We can only guess what giants we've already lost. You know, if you're talking economics and you're talking about jobs within forestry, I mean, why are you going to replace your best saw log forest and put plantations in there? I mean, obviously you're not gearing up for a future in saw logs. You're just basically putting in the lowest commodity and putting it into pulp. Somehow, at the edge of all this destruction, a magnificent tree had been left standing. Wow. At a whopping 78 metres, this white gum is huge. These remaining giants are becoming rare and their potential for future tourism is enormous. There's been other trees that have been magnificent, like, you know, similar white gums, maybe a different type, that, you know, have been cut down because they don't meet forestry's policy. Giant trees under 80 metres are only worth a few thousand dollars as wood chips. Imagine how much more these giant trees would be worth if they were left standing. Generations of tourists will come to see them from all over the world. But there are people out there committed to saving the Tasmanian forest. And I'm going to get on the road and meet some of them. In the northeast of Tasmania, is a place called the Blue Tear. 
and this is home to one of Tasmania's biggest trees, the blue tiered giant. As I walk through these ancient forests to get to the blue tiered giant, I feel like I've been transported back to another time. It was rare places like this where life still managed to survive the freezing conditions of the last ice age, 15,000 years ago. But after surviving all that, this magnificent forest is one of the many places scheduled to be destroyed by Clearfell. And here it is, the blue tiered giant. Hello, is anyone in there? Hello, Lucy. Hi, Lucy, how are you doing? What? So what's the history of this tree? It's thought to be at least 400 years old, which really 400 years is the life span of a eucalypt. But it's obviously ancient. It's quite a bit bigger than any of the others around here. Um, it's got a 19.4 metre girth. And you can fit a few people in this tree? Yes. The day that the public came to view the tree, 60 people stood inside the tree. That's a pretty big tree. That's huge. Is that one of the biggest in the state? Yeah, it ha it's the third largest recorded tree in the state. Let's take a look at this monster. Leslie, come and take a look at how big it really is when you put some light in here. There's homes for lots of animals. Oh, wow. Incredible, huh? Did you know it went that high? No, I've never had a torch that would do it like that. Oh, lots of little spiders. There's probably thousands of things live in this tree. Yeah. That's a spider web. With lots of little insects around it. It's got a back door. <laughs> Room for extensions. You can see from the burnt charcoal in here, these giants must have survived many forest fires. It's got to be a four better. <laughs> it's a high rise. Yeah. Leslie's been coming to the Blue Tears since she was a child. It's so hard for the local community to watch this beautiful place disappear. This tree is 16.8 metres round the girth, but we're not sure if that's big enough to save it or not. Mutual Valley, the next valley over, was just like this. And we walked through before any, any of the trees had been chopped down. And there were groves of these gigantic trees. And there's really, there's none of them left, really. The whole valley floor now is plantation. And there's one small patch left on the top of the ridge, which is the best that the community could do, hang on to. And that's it. Can you imagine? hoeing your chainsaw into something like this. You know, dozing up these magnificent ferns. It's just really, really hard to imagine that anyone could actually physically do it. Or mentally do it, I guess, would be more the point. But, you know, I've, I've brought hundreds of people to this area we're in now, and, you know, without fail, they, firstly, they can't believe that it would even be considered to be clear-filled. And, you know, they all say they couldn't bear to think of that happening. But they don't really know what to do or how to stop it. These big guys are real survivors. But will my children get the chance to experience what I'm seeing now?
we're on our way to the Styx Valley, the land of the giants. Now I'm getting back to some of my grandfather's favourite territory, the awesome southern forest of Tasmania. This is the Styx Valley, the Valley of the Giants. The Styx Valley is attracting people from all over the world. These magical forests could easily be the setting for the Lord of the Rings. And like in the movie, these ancient trees are in danger. I can't believe all this is earmarked for clear felling. Well, these are some of the tallest trees on Earth, actually. Regnans is the tallest species that grows on this planet and so many people are coming to see them now from all over Australia and all over the world. Thanks. Thanks. Massive! <laughs> yeah. This is the granddaddy of all the trees. This is a giant. It really strikes a deep moral chord with most Australians and, and people from elsewhere around the world that these are something that people love so much. They're precious on the planet. This debate is as much about values as it is about the environment. It's a moral issue. And we're standing here underneath a tree that's 450 to 500 years old, and there's no one that comes here that thinks this is right to chop a forest like this down. It's my climbing belt. Time to get geared up. I have to really concentrate on gearing up. The excitement of climbing this giant is taking over. I'm on my way to the highest tree seat in the world. Oh, I'm going up the big tree. You see the guys at the top? See what it's like to live up a tree. I'm only a third of the way up, but it sure looks a long way down. Climbing to one of the biggest giants in the valley, 65 metres above the ground. This is an incredible feeling. Not many people ever get this privilege. But here at the Global Rescue Station, they live here, up this tree, and will be here for months. What a climb. It must get pretty scary up here when the gale force winds are blowing. These guys are really organised and have come from many countries to try to do something about Tassie's forests. They are up here for months at a time with all their supplies to eat, sleep, to live up here. We've received over 30,000 emails of support. We're in the communications tent and from here we can communicate with the world. I'm about to send an email, let people know where I am. And I'm not the only one to come up here. <laughs> Legendary musician John Butler is really concerned about what's happening in Tasmania's forests.
these forests need to be protected and respected and appreciated by future generations and not clear failed, burnt, poisoned, and wood chipped. Back in my granddad's day, they thought Tasmania's forests were a limitless resource. But towards the end of his working life, in the 1970s, technology changed. And I have to wonder how he would feel today. Today's generation can often see the impact of things previous generations have done and are now faced with many unforeseen problems. I've learned what clear felling is all about. I've learned that clear felling is not about using a resource, it's about destroying a resource. If we manage these forests properly, we can have these forests for centuries. There's tons, millions of tons of timber that we can use in these forests. But if we destroy them, just knock them all down, we'll never get them back. They've taken thousands and thousands of years to grow to what they are today, and that's not going to come back overnight. I know I want my kids to see forests like I've seen, and my grandfather wanted me to see forests like he saw. Let's hope we realise that before it's too late, we can actually do something about this and we can think about protecting our forests so that everybody can enjoy it. Everybody from all around the world. I've had a fantastic time here in Tasmania, seeing some of the most incredible sights I've ever seen. But it's been mixed with a lot of sadness as well. But the thing I think I've enjoyed most is meeting some wonderful people. And we're heading back to the Blue Tear to go to a Blue Tear Festival. One, two, three, four. And this is where some of the tallest trees in the world end up, reduced from forest giants to wood chips. There's a decision to be made. Do we sacrifice our forests for a short-term gain? Or do we protect these forests for us and for future generations? I'm sure the children of tomorrow would appreciate seeing the natural wonders that we have just seen. The way things are going, one thing's for sure. Any magnificent natural environment left standing 
will be a priceless treasure. Because worldwide, there'll be so little of it left. <laughs>